So welcome everyone. So today we're gonna, we're gonna discuss about um, IPFS. So um, and uh, the main goal of the talk is to explain a bit you a bit more about how the uh, protocol works and in terms of OSINT and uh, CTI, what can we uh, achieve and what can we find um, on that. So I'm Patrick, he's Tongi, and we are basically uh, working at uh, Fuzzing Labs, where we focused on blockchain security, uh, and we are right now uh, working on a, a dedicated OSINT platform for uh, blockchain data. So a quick introduction to uh, IPFS. So IPFS stands for uh, Interplanetary File System. So the main idea is it's a peer-to-peer -peer network uh, where we basically uh, share uh, data to, to each other. So it's pretty old now, like 10 years old, um, but um, it's still pretty active. There is uh, like 30k nodes uh, annually uh, in average, and most of them are mainly using the, the Go client, which is uh, Kubo. And most of them are basically based in the US. So the idea is pretty simple. Um, it's content addressing um, instead of location addressing. What that means is instead of having like a file store on the server with like a direct communication over IP to it, um, you will basically get the files which will be stored by uh, a node um, with a dedicated CID, so a unique identifier. And when you're going to request the file, uh, it will be the dedicated peer nodes that will uh, return you the, the file. So it's used by a lot of different projects, most of them, of course, uh, blockchain related, but it's actually also used for controversial and illegal usage from a uh, darknet forum, a darknet marketplace, phishing page, botnet, and, and so on. So one good example is, for example, the PowerStar uh, IPFS variant. So what you can see actually on the on the piece of code is that uh, they are mentioning multiple IPFS gateway. So it's a way to uh, actually download IPFS content over HTTP. And they will basically uh, iterate or pick one of uh, these domain uh, to um, download uh, what they need. In the same way, we have IP um, Storm, which in that case is a botnet, and they are basically using IPFS for communication. So they will basically receive um, C2 commands uh, directly from uh, IPFS, I mean, at least retrieve them from um, IPFS network. So just to give you an, an idea, what is the actual the complete process if you want to upload something uh, on EPFS and access to, to it. So the first step is actually for you as uh, Alice to upload the file on EPFS. So there is multiple way. The first one will be for you to run a local node. So you will um, get your node running locally. It will calculate some stuff. We're going to see uh, what right after. And it will basically tell to everyone, okay, I pin this file, so I'm the one with the owner of this file, and if someone needs it, uh, you need to download it from me. You can, of course, use uh, centralized services. So in that case, you're going to upload the file to an external services that will do the pinning and store the file uh, for you and make it available to uh, the other part of IPFS. And then you have decentralized services um, in the same way. Uh, they will um, basically just store the file for you uh, and make it available. It just is depending if it's like just an interface to another local node or if it's like a direct node where you upload the, the stuff. So in detail, what will happen first is the IPLD creation. So the main idea is you get uh, like a folder with different files and uh, you're going to create like a structure uh, out of it. So the main goal will be first to create a content identifier. So it will be a unique ID specific to uh, the file. Inside this CID, there is multiple uh, stuff uh, that is contained, like a base, a version, codec, and then the cryptographic hash, the content, which uh, you, you're going to see will be uh, really important uh, later. So we have a unique identifier for each file. So uh, in practice, uh, after that, we will basically get the structure uh, out of it with all those different files uh, on it. Each of them will get a CID, the folder will get a CID. And what is also really interesting is if the file is too big, it's going to be split into multiple chunks, which each of them getting their own uh, CID. 
all the all the structure is uh, basically a Merkel DAG, so I will not enter the, into the detail, but just keep uh, that in mind. So once we get the structure and the different files content, um, all of that will be uploaded to a node. So as I mentioned, either locally or not. What you can notice on the slide is the node actually have a dedicated ID. It's what we call um, the peer ID. Um, and it gets important uh, after regarding who is supposed to store uh, files. So we upload everything uh, on the node, and then uh, the node will create records. So it's basically a table where you associate for each CID who is the PID that is owning this file. So in that case, we can see it's the, the same node. So we have a bunch of records, and then those records will be shared to the, ne to the network. So at this point, the important uh, stuff to, to keep in mind is the files are, and the structure, um, the whole content is not uploaded to the network directly. It's not shared to all, all the other peers. It's only the records. So who is the owner? Once the uh, records are shared, they will be saved by all the different peers. And um, if someone needs the file, you're going to see that we will basically um, follow the records to uh, find this specific uh, node. So, oh, my bad. So, let's say Bob wants to read a file from IPFS. Um, so, again, multiple solutions. Ezer is running himself a local node. So, he, he's going to ask for um, the, he's going to provide the CID and ask for the file. So, what will happen will be um, basically IPFS communication to the network um, and asking for the, for the file. Either you can use a gateway, so you may be so a uh, Cloudflare gateway, Pinata, and there is uh, a bunch of other ones that are um, basically providers, so it's a good way to access to IPFS over HTTP, basically. And then you can do that directly on the browser. Basically, the browser is just wrapping uh, the, the stuff. Either uh, they will basically have a list of dedicated gateway directly in the browser, um, or either uh, you will be able to basically pinpoint to like a local RPC uh, call and uh, that could. So Brave, for example, is doing that. So the way it works regarding the searching and um, getting the data back is this way. So let's say Bob wants to have the record A. He will basically ask the first node he knows uh, about that. He will say, OK, please tell me who is the owner of this uh, specific CID. And what will happen is that the peer will say, oh, I don't know. Um, it's not me. Uh, the, the people, the peer ID that I know the most close to you is this one. So you, they will basically do like a sort shift between the CID and the peer ID. And based on that, they will find who is the, the more close to the content. So that's why uh, I was telling you the peer ID is not storing files, it's storing the records, and it's not even storing all the records. It will only store the records uh, close to close to him. So the um, bomb will basically uh, get as an information, now you need to ask the PID number five. He will do the same communication and ask PID number five, do you have the records uh, and do you have the contents? Five will say, no, it's seven that owns it. And he will ask seven and seven will uh, give him the, the data. So as you can see, it's basically like multiple communication to get one file. And uh, you also start to see that we can uh, basically also monitor all of that. So Tongi, we're going to discuss uh, a bit more about the OSINT and CTI part. Hi. So um, now we have to kind of understand the IPFS. We're going to know, we're going to see uh, what we can do to um, um, understand better what is happening on it. So first of all, uh, what we must check is uh, where to find IPFS link and what to learn from uh, from this. Um, IPFS links can be shared on many different platforms or different uh, systems like blockchain, uh, via email. Um, we can find them using Google Doc. Uh, they can be shared on websites, on our forums, Telegram, uh, discussion channels. And dep depending on the, this platform, we can learn different things. Like um, in CFT. so as for example, there is a lot of files um, which are related to NFT, 
uh, which are stored on the blockchain. So uh, from this, we can have blockchain address and the date because they are uh, all the transactions are signed on the blockchain. Uh, we have also some of those files, which are uh, some of those links, which are uh, already analyzed by uh, tools like VirusTotal, which can uh, give us some information about the date uh, the links has, has been first seen. We can also find them on the archive or social media, uh, decentralized archive or decentralized social media, or forum or the and discussion channel, uh, as I told you. Now, um, what if a file is not uh, available anymore? There is two possibilities. Uh, the first one is uh, 410 error, which means the, the file has been censored by, by a gateway. Um, for this, you can try to use other gateway, which may not censor the, the file, or you can uh, directly uh, download the file using your own node. And the other cause, because uh, it's the uh, error 504, which means that the the file is not accessible, so it could be two reasons. First, the, the node hosting the file is not accessible for whatever reason, or the file has never been on IPFS because uh, we can um, generate a link but never share the file actually on IPFS. For this, you can try to use uh, the Wayback Machine because it's possible to uh, upload the link on the Wayback Machine, for example. And you can try to find the file on other um, decentralized uh, storage services like Filecoin or, or, or Reef. And then um, we can try to find uh, file variants on IPFS using the structure, because as you seen before, um, it's using a Merkel direct acyclic graph to uh, structure all the file and um, the folders. But for example, if um, if there is two people uploading a, a web page, but they, they both choose to uh, put the same logo on the page, uh, the logo uh, will have uh, the same identifier for both pages. So we can see that. And at a file level, as a big file are uh, split in chunks, if we take a big file and just modify the end of the file, it will be the same. The, the first two chunks will be the same, uh, will be, will have the same ID, and only the last chunks will have a diff different ID. This is um, still uh, be, uh, a bit limited, because if we change just uh, the first bit of a file, all this, uh, this content identifier will be different. Then uh, we can do something in pretty interesting. It's uh, retrieve files from IOCs because uh, there is a big correlation between IOC and uh, CID. Uh, CID contains uh, SHA-256 of the file, as you can see on the right, and other information. And for example, we can improve network detection using this. Uh, here is um, an example uh, on the left, uh, uh, IPFS link of a phishing page, which is uh, not um, at 14 and virus total, but if you take the um, hash of the file behind this link, uh, it's uh, at uh, 31 on a virus total. On, on the other way, you can go so from the, um, an IOC hash and um, compute uh, the CID it will, um, it will make uh, and uh, try to find the CID uh, on IPFS, which uh, I have done here on with a, a phishing page. So now we can talk uh, what we can do about uh, the nodes in IPFS. So uh, often if you want to uh, have more information about the file, you will uh, ask uh, the, the network who, which node is hosting this file. Then you can ask the identity of the, of the peer hosting the file. Here you will have uh, different information. For example, it's public key, which can allow you to compute this IPNS, which is like a DNS for IPFS. You have different addresses, so uh, which give you an IP where you can do uh, different uh, IP recon techniques. You have its agent version, um, which can give you uh, some information about it. Uh, as example, uh, for the IP Storm botnet, it's uh, an old version of IPFS clients, which is named Storm, and you can find all the still uh, not, not, uh, all the nodes still in the botnet, just uh, looking at their version. And last, uh, you can see the different protocols the node is using. 
for example, the, the one uh, interesting are uh, pub sub protocol because it means the node is uh, participating in uh, real time messaging with other nodes for different reasons. So you can also uh, do um, more global uh, monitoring or calling over IPFS to uh, have a bigger picture of the network. Here is a pretty good tool uh, called Nebula, which can uh, basically do uh, the IPFS peer, uh, so get the identity of all the nodes of the network. And yeah, see if you want to really gather as much as information as possible on the IPFS, you have to um, do like a continuous monitoring of nodes and files because IPFS does not store any historical data. And um, by monitoring uh, the distributed hash table on the bit swap requests going into the network, you can um, do many things like the first ping of steering, the first peer listing a file when the file was first seen. Uh, if you know, um, if there is new CID using um, all CIDs that you already know as malicious or things like that, like, like that, you can track the nodes joining and quitting, and you can also, also track uh, all the pub-sub uh, topics used by the different nodes and um, monitor what what they are communicating uh, one to another. And yeah, for the end. Uh, as for most uh, decentralized network, if you want to gather as much as information as possible, the best way is to uh, understand the protocol, uh, set up a sufficient amount of nodes, and uh, make them log uh, the information you are interested in. Uh, I'd let Patrick uh, do the conclusion. So in conclusion, um, so as you, as you saw, IPFS is actually not really complicated. Uh, we can even say it's even more really blockchain related in some way. Um, it's um, basically a P2P protocol being on top of Leap P2P. So yeah, if you are interested in this kind of stuff, and even in, in blockchain protocols in general, Leap P2P will be a recurrent uh, stuff uh, in, your, in your scope. So the, what we need to, to remind is, so it's content addressing, objects are um, okay, identified by CID, each peer own uh, and store CIDs. So monitoring is really the best way for you to uh, get a trace of which IP is associated or is providing which CID and so on. Um, in terms of uh, attacker point of view, um, if they want to um, basically um, propagate uh, like a phishing page or malware and so on, uh, it might be really interesting for them to basically uh, set up their own node just to be sure uh, they will never be like censored or the, the file will never be removed uh, in some way. So as you saw, OSINT and CINTI can uh, be applied at different levels, uh, either CID and leak diffusion, and there is multiple stuff to do uh, on that. Uh, regarding gateway specifically, um, I saw a lot of Yara rules or, or like IOCs that only take uh, in consideration, uh, like they take the full link with uh, ipfs.io slash ipfs and so on. So just keep in mind that uh, changing to another gateway is really easy. There is plenty of them. Um, so um, just um, keep that in mind if you want to, to do like like network detection, uh, what might be more interesting for you is is more than that. And in the same way, uh, it's really easy for you to compute a CID into uh, like retrieve the SHA uh, 256 from that. And of course, uh, it could be uh, good um, to know exactly what is behind and uh, getting the the hash of the file without having even your software to actually download the file and do the computation uh, itself. So at the networking level, it it really makes sense. So um, right now we are working on uh, other um, IPFS related stuff. Um, typically the IPNS, which is kind of DNS on uh, IPFS. We are also doing a lot of uh, monitoring of PubSub, uh, which is uh, right now actually used to um, like illegal um, stuff where basically they are using IPFS as a way to set up uh, like ghost um, communication channels that will disappear after that if, again, you are not monitoring everything. 
There is also uh, other decentralized uh, storage network that could be interesting for you, like Airwave and Swarm. It's basically the same concept, but uh, on uh, other uh, chain, uh, another um, decentralized network, which uh, in that case will work the same, but again, not the same uh, gateway, not the same, um, yeah. In, in the idea, pretty much the same, uh, but um, it will not be detected in the same way for you. And what can happen is actually um, a malware can definitely use IPFS in the first, um, like the first shot, in the first try, uh, and then fall back to something else uh, like that. Um, especially for the the one from you uh, that are uh, potentially blocking. A, Everything that is IPFS related, like whatever IPFS link, uh, it could be a bypass uh, that way. And we are also integrating uh, IPFS and all of that into our uh, blockchain within platform, where we basically uh, monitor uh, and do uh, like de-anonymization and profiling of um, whatever blockchain address uh, we we have. So thanks for your time, and I'm happy to take any question if you have. Hello, I don't have questions actually, a nice talk because I think it's very important to make awareness of new system which criminals are already widely used. So we look into this last year briefly and for us the conclusion was it's another bulletproof hosting which really hard to take down. We found pretty huge phishing campaigns and adaptive phishing kits which adopt to the domain uh, Criminals trying to fish, we put in like icons on the fishing page, automa page automatically. And uh, we also found uh, use of uh, IPFS as C2 and for hosting of malicious samples. So I think it's something industry misses a lot and it's already in the wild and for not for the first year. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for your talk. Um, found very interesting. You made reference on, I think, the previous slide to uh, common gateways. There's a link there to common gateways. Could you just share some details around that? How oh, uh, yeah, sure. Um, well, so basically, um, as I mentioned, like a gateway will be uh, like a basic uh, web two uh, website, uh, and uh, what will happen is they will make the interface between the IPFS network. So they will basically run a node, um, and they will uh, give you the, the access over HTTP. So what is interesting is um, so there is a bunch of famous gateway, um, and even Cloudflare and some other services are actually uh, gateways. Um, so what you so there is different usage of the gateway that you might be interesting for you. Um, so as Tanguy mentioned, especially if the stuff is uh, like you want to access a file but it's censored, uh, it just means it's censored on this gateway. So if you change the gateway, it will not be censored anymore. And there is actually a lot of uh, a lot of them. Uh, if you take um, on this website uh, at the bottom, uh, it's basically updating every time uh, all the gateway available. And what will happen is, as you can see, there is the country. And if you take a country that is, let's say, less uh, restrict, uh, you will still be able to access the, the content. So that's the first point to, to, take, uh, to keep in mind. The second point is, um, in terms of detection point of view, uh, if you are only detecting the, um, on the URL the most common IPFS uh, gateway, um, you might miss something. So what I would suggest you to do is uh, if you have an IPFS link, um, it could be interesting first to maybe do a kind of a regex for the CID because it 
that is made by the case for that. So you will keep uh, what the CID is and maybe do manipulation on that, or even extract the SHA-256 and do the detection on the SHA-256 more than the, the link of the gateway. Um, and again, there is multiple gateways, so you need to be aware of what are the, the latest that, that can be used, and um, this website could be a, a nice way to, to get that. So, Tonki, what's the name of the website? I think we didn't put it on the, on the slide. The website on this one, with all the IPFS gateway. Do you remember? What is the link? It's a link. Uh, it's a public gateway checker, I think. On the you will find it. Okay. Uh, I have a question on the tr tracking, where we were talking about tracking, and you said uh, to track you need to set up a sufficient number. Uh, could you elaborate what, I mean, sufficient amount of nodes, uh, on which variables are, I mean, the, the minimum number of nodes that you need to set up? Yeah, right. so the main uh, idea if you want to monitor is basically kind of, it will be more easy if I put this slide. So if you want to monitor everything that is happening, as you can see, the nodes based on their PID are basically, um, will be across a certain range. Um, so depending of the PID, it will be in one position of the range or another. So if you want to monitor every CID that come across, you will need to set up multiple nodes across this um, this range, basically. And the more nodes you have, the more chance you will get to have someone that will ask for records. So you will know which file are asked uh, on the network. So again, it's like the more nodes you have, the more info you have. So it's just a matter of you to, to also get that. Um, I didn't, I think we didn't mention that, but um, also keep in mind that, of course, if you are using, uh, or if attackers are using Cloudflare or whatever big name as um, IPFS gateway, or even if they upload the file using their services, um, I mean, there are centralized services, so you, you might also, in terms of law enforcement, you might be able to, to, to do requests um, to them to actually get uh, information about which IP and who is the, who is the, the guy who actually uploaded the file on, on that. So if they are using, if attackers are using IPFS and they are not taking too much care of that, you are still, you still have a way to, to get extra data on that. With that, thank you very much.